Hello, my name is Forrest Zhang, and today I'll be discussing research done with Professor Greg Bodwin at the University of Michigan on rating systems with an intensive compatible property that we call opponent indifference. We'll start off by discussing what exactly a rating system is. Um, a rating system is a set of functions used to give and adjust real number of ratings um, associated with players in competitive games. These ratings are used to rank players with higher rating, ratings being better and to predict the outcome of match results. Our model specifically considers ratings that are one, one dimensional, meaning that they only consider one rating par parameter, two, memoryless, which means that they don't consider any other rating statistics, for example, maybe a win-loss percentage, and three, zero sum, meaning that they only, that, that rating gained by one player corresponds to rating loss by another player. Um, these these uh, specifications are, of our model are tweaks and generalizations of previous rating systems discussed in the resources below. Formally speaking, we say a rating system must have a skill curve, which gives the probability of winning uh, for a player with a rating of the first input against a player of a rating of the second input and an adjustment function, which gives the amount of rating gained from a match by a player with a rating of the first input, if they beat a player with a rating of the second input. We also require that, um, that the skill curve be draw-free, which means that it just there is no possibility of draws. Um, a lot of rating systems have this, like ELO, and they account for draws by um, basically saying it's a half win and a half a loss. And that's a pretty easy way to account for it mathematically. And just and this is just done to make things easier to for for the model and simpler. And we also require that higher ratings have a higher chance of winning. So that means that um, it must the, the skill curve must be increasing in the first input and decreasing in the second input. Our adjustment function must also be consequential, which means it's possible for someone to gain rating from the match. Um, and this is natural because then matches are actually meaningful in terms of rating or else they're matches that don't actually do anything. Um, additionally, we cannot just have an arbitrary skill curve and an adjustment function. We have to have a fairness axiom. I'm going to state this in terms of a expected gain function. Um, and for this function, we follow the, the model that Every single player has a current and true rating um, that a lot of other previous works follow, um, where the current rating uh, is what the rating system thinks your rating should be, and it's what it has it in, in log, and the true rating is what actually is the probability of you winning a match. So, and then the true rating is denoted by the star. Um, so our expected gain function then has four inputs, the first two inputs being associated with the first player and the second two inputs being associated with the second player. Um, and we have the, the probability of winning times of weighted rating gain if you, win, win, if you win, subtracted by the probability of losing times the rating loss um, of you, if you lose. And this is essentially just the expected value of the rating change. Um, and then the fairness axiom is stating that if both players are correctly rated, the expected gain should be zero. Um, discussing, pri discussing prior work, um, you'll see that ELO is the most popular rating system to the point that ratings are sometimes just called ELO. Um, and it's based on the logistic skill curve, um, where you have, which is shown on the right, where like a, a rating system of, a, a rating difference of like minus 100 would be associated with a um, win percentage of 40% in this case. And um, most previous work focuses on adding additional parameters to increase accuracy of match predictions. Uh, for example, we have Glico, um, which is a two-dimensional lift of ELO that also incorporates a volatility parameter. Um, and this will make it so that your rating increases uh, rating change is higher if your volatility parameter is higher. And this has been shown to converge to um, true ratings faster. Um, but we actually focus more on something called the sense of compatibility, where um, you want the, 
rating system designed to encourage behavior that is compatible with what the rating system's designers want the players to, to do. So a recent line of work actually looks at Glico and sees if we can exploit it and asks, um, exploit this volatility parameter and asks whether or not uh, Glico is incentive compatible. Um, and it turns out that it is not incentive compatible because of volatility hacking. So um, this is when a player lowers their rating to a point where they can control the outcome of a match. Um, here, games are easy enough so that they can win if they wanted to, and they can alternate between winning and losing sets of games to, for, to farm volatility. Um, and with this higher volatility, they can then play normally and overshoot their, the, the rating in which they would naturally converge to pretty consistently. Um, this is bad for incentive compatibility for uh, two reasons. For one, uh, players don't want to win every game. But also, um, there, there are behaviors that are not associated with how good you are at the game that affect your rating and can affect it pretty consistently, um, which means that the ratings do not accurately um, reflect the skill of the players. And this um, exploit was first discovered in Pokemon Go, actually, and it had practical implications um, for the leaderboard, where um, it was much easier to get higher places on the leaderboard if you uh, use this exploit. Um, Epticar and Liu actually showed that other rating systems are also vulnerable to a similar attack, um, and they proposed ways to, to fix this in a, in a recent paper. Our motivations are a little bit different. We focus on a less pernicious, but perhaps more common type of attack called opponent selection, where players will choose um, opponents with specific ratings to maintain a higher average rating than if they than otherwise. Um, we've always shown that if you're correctly rated and your opponent's correctly rated, that this um, there's no benefit to choosing opponents of specific ratings, but this becomes more of a concern if you're incorrectly rated and a lot of times you aren't correctly rated. Your rating will, your true rating will fluctuate a lot um, from day to day and over time. Um, so for example, you might be tired one day. And in that case, you actually know that if you're tired, that you're probably overrated that day. So maybe that day you, you choose uh, opponents of a specific rating up over other opponents. And this is a concern mainly for chess websites where they give you a lot of control over your opponent's ratings. Um, this can be done in three ways. Uh, one is aborting games after seeing the rating of your opponent without any rating penalty. Um, two is limiting the rating of matchmaking so that you only play players within a specific rating range. And three is selectively initiating matches against specific players or accepting challenges of, of players of specific um, ratings. And this is, all three of these things can be done on the two most popular uh, chess websites, chess.com and Lee Chess. And this is not incentive compatible for uh, the same reason as Glico, where you have things other than skill affecting the ratings. And we focus on designing a, um, rating systems that structurally defend against this type of um, attack. Um, and we call these ratings opponent indifferent. To informally describe what we want, we want a rating system that uh, does not give any rating incentive to selectively choose your opponent. Um, before discussing exactly what results, there are some useful notions and ideas of, uh, about rating systems to discuss. Um, one is a K function, which is a generalization of an idea from ELO, where they describe their, their adjustment functions in terms of the skill curve and a K factor. Um, we generalize this to say that it's a, to, to say that it's a function instead of a factor, so this can mean the non-constant, and we say it's equal to, um, alpha of xy plus alpha of yx. Um, and we get this result from manipulating the expected gain function and the fairness axiom. Um, we also have this idea of triviality. Um, trivial rating systems are basically flat. All ratings mean the same thing, practically speaking. And these rating systems are not very useful and they create weird edge cases. So many of our results were just omit them. And we have this idea of translation invariance which means that skill curve is completely determined by differences in rating. Um, so a probability that a 
person of rating 100 beating a, a rating of 90 would be the same as a, ten, a probability of a person of rating 10 beating a player of, of rating 0. And as seen before, um, ELO is, is, um, is translation invariant, and this is a plus because translation, translation invariant skill curves are a lot easier to interpret. Um, basically, across the board, it means rating changes and rating differences mean the same thing. Um, moving on, we have the first attempt at defending against uh, opponent selection attacks. We call this opponent indifference. Uh, formally, we say that the expected gain function when your opponent is correctly rated only depends on your true rating and current rating. Um, and we find that we actually do have opponent indifferent rating systems and they have some structure. Um, we find two things. One is that they must have a constant k function and two, they must be written in, in this form in terms of a, of a single input function we call a bisector that's weakly increasing. Um, and we call it, when, when the skill curve is in this form, we call it separable. Um, all of this sounds really good. Uh, it sounds like we're maybe even done that we, we solved the problem, but, um, it turns out that these, uh, opponent and different rating systems aren't very useful and mainly it's because of their ability to measure the depth of a player pool. So for, for a rating system to be useful, there has to be some notion of depth in the player pool. Um, and we kind of want a way to gauge if a player, if a, if a rating system is able to, to be useful in any way at measuring depth. Um, and we can, we can use this idea of skill chains to help us out with that. So a skill chain is basically when you have a list of, uh, of, uh, ratings such that, the a player with the first rating beats the player with the second rating with high probability. The player with the second rating beats the next player um, with another with also similarly high probability, and so on. Uh, for example, for example, um, in chess, you have a grandmaster being a tournament player with ninety five percent probability, a tournament player being a hobbyist with ninety five percent probability, and a hobbyist being a beating a beginner with ninety five percent probability. Um, so this would be a skill chain of length four. And in trying to gauge if a rating system can be useful in any way, we don't want to require that these probabilities be too high because there are probabilistic gains that limit the win rate um, for high, highly skilled players. Uh, as an example, you might have chess with a, with a coin toss at the beginning. So both players toss a coin, and if the player with heads wins if there is a difference in the coin toss. But if the coin toss is the same, then they play a game of chess. Um, in this case, the win rate would be kept at 75%, but it still might be useful for a rating system here to model this uh, player pool in this game. Um, and you can imagine play games with depth that have much lower capped win rates. So, but still we, we, we want the, the, the rating system to be able to accommodate an infinitely long chain, um, because it means that we can't, we don't have a limit to the amount of depth that we, we can model. Um, formally speaking, we call this the, this property of infinitely long chain uh, full scale, and we say that there if it has full scale if there exists some probability p greater than zero point five, and an infinitely ascending chain of ratings r one, r two, etc., such that the probability of r one beating r one r i beating r i minus one is greater than p for all i. Um, and we our first main result is that opponent indifferent rating systems cannot satisfy full scale. Uh, to build some intuition on why this is the case, once we have the skill curve um, as separable in terms of this bisector that's bounded, um, if we have a rating like R2 that's, that has a advantage of a probability of beating R1 of P, we know that there is some positive number P minus 0.5 that beta of R2 must be greater than beta of R1. And it's similarly for R3, for beta of R3 compared to beta of R2, it must be greater than it by the same positive number, P minus 0.5. And if you have an infinitely long chain of ratings um, that have this property, eventually you'll have a beta that it goes beyond the bounds. Um, and this will consequently uh, have mean that you have a skill curve that has probabilities of winning greater than one which is impossible.
And you might say that we don't need infinitely long scale chains because um, in practice we don't actually get infinitely long scale chains. But even for very reasonable values of p like 0.75, the maximum scale length of a, of a scale chain is still 3 for any opponent in different rating system, which is, which is way too short. Um, instead of fixing this problem though, we will, we will um, talk about generalization of uh, opponent indifference to make future results a little bit more intuitive. Um, one thing we assume in opponent indifference is that our opponents are correctly rated, but in reality they are most likely to be incorrectly rated. We don't really know most of the time by how much or, or um, if they're over or underrated, but sometimes you, you might know, you might have some knowledge of the clearing pool. So, um, if you do have this knowledge, uh, it's natural to ask, uh, can we still be a different about opponents that are misrated by the same amount? And it turns out we can. Um, we call this property strongly opponent indifferent, and we formally describe it as having um, the expected gain function depend on additional parameter delta, where delta describes how much your opponent is misrated by. So instead of assuming that y, um, y and y star are the same, we assume y star is y plus delta. And um, we, we find additional structure to strongly opponent indifferent rating systems. Um, we, we find that the bisectors must be linear, in fact. And these types of rating systems have two, addition, um, two pros. One is that they generalize opponent indifference. And two is that uh, having a linear bisector uh, requires that the, um, that the rating system be translation varied. But it has one big drawback, which is that having a linear bisector uh, within a bounded range means that the, the slope of the bisector must be zero which then implies that the scale curve is flat and must be trivial. So these are very useless, but it'll help us build some intuition about future results. Um, so moving on to actually fixing opponent indifference, uh, we use this idea of thresholding. So we can threshold where we care and where we are opponent indifferent. And thresholding is, is used in practice when implementing a lot of um, uh, rating systems because the, the, we assume that there's some chaos in the game, such that like at the extremes, our, our model doesn't hold as so well. Um, for example, FIDE, which is the um, the official international chess organization, they they uh, bound ELO in their implementation. Um, they use something called the 400 point rule, where differences in rating higher than 400 points are treated the same as uh, a 400 point difference. And you can see that on the right left here. And our idea is that we only really care about opponent indifference among ratings that are relative to each other. Um, this accounts for the common case. Um, you're not going to be misrated by that much. And you're not going to be playing people that are wildly way better than you or wildly worse than you for, for the most part. And we can, we can see that um, later that this bound of what we call relative is very large. So really, oh, that, that's a... And we, we can still we can still save opponent indifference from being um, not able to satisfy full scale with very large bounds on on this uh, what we call relative. So formally speaking, we say that a rating x and y are are relative if they are p close, which means that the probability of winning is bounded between 0.5 minus p and 0.5 plus p, um, and p can be as big as 0.5 itself. So Really, this means that the probability of winning is within 0 and 100. Um, so it's a lot. Um, and uh, we, we define P opponent indifference if essentially opponents are opponent indifferent, um, players are opponent indifferent when the parameters are P close. Um, and we show very, very, very similar results as before where we have a constant k function um, and a separable scale curve, but only when x and y are p close. And these results imply that there exists p opponent in different rating systems that satisfy full scale. You can just have a bisector that's increasing, and let's say it's linear, for example, you can just bound the scale curve such that when it's greater than one, um, it just equals one, and if it's less than zero, it just equals zero. And that would be uh, p opponent indifferent and also satisfy full scale.
Um, and we also can apply the strong modifier to our notion of p-opponent difference to get strong p-opponent difference. So the definition is very similar. We have strong opponent difference, but only when the parameters are p-close. And we also show similar results um, that the, linear, the bisector must be linear, which implies translation invariance for p-close values. The more important thing is that these types of rating systems have shown some practical utility. The Sonus rating system has been argued by Jeff Sonus to um, be superior to ELO in predicting the outcome of high-level chess matches. So in this graph, you can see the, the threshold of linear skill curve, which is the Sonus rating system, uh, matches the, the results of, of, the, of high-level chess matches very closely. So um, in conclusion, we found that strong P opponent um, different rating systems reasonably protect against opponent selection tax and they have some practical utility. Um, looking towards the future, we see three ways to expand on this work. Um, one is to relax our model to include uh, rating systems that are not memoryless, not zero-sum, or not one-dimensional, and see if we can satisfy some notion of opponent difference that way. Um, we can go into this direction, which was suggested by an anonymous reviewer, where um, you have a separate display rating that you have full control over, and a, um, and an actual rating that is used to rank you, and see if you um, if this allows for protection against opponent selection attacks. And thirdly, we have um, to cons we can consider opponent indifference along with other desirable properties, maybe like fast convergence. I see in Glico and other or other natural um, ideas might be to include other notions of strategy proofness. Oh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, have a wonderful day.